Paul McCartney and Wings were playing. We were determined to get backstage at any cost, at any, in any way. We did. The fact that I got to go on two Led Zeppelin tours was like a rite of passage for me. Eventually I found myself in a room with Keith Richards and Ron Wood. I did a piece for Cream when I went on the road with the Ramones in Texas. Leonard Skinner was a really important story for me. They were on the tour with the Runaways. But if you had to pick my favorite um, assignment, it would probably be George Harrison. The Clash, I remember when they were at the, the Motor City Roller Rink. That was a great assignment. I loved it. My responsibility, as I see it as a critic, is not to help a lot of new bands who sell their records. It's to help people that are buying the records. Rock writers like priests and life coaches and the crazy person screaming on the street corner are here to try and show you the true and righteous way and what matters. Because music matters, damn it, it really does. There are two parts of being a good critic. First, you have to know what you like. And second, you have to be able to explain honestly why you like it, even if the reason is completely disgraceful. The tradition of critics in the printed word goes back to newspapers and critics would review theatre, plays, and opera, and books. The first critic caveman would say, you know, over by the bushes down in the valley the hunting's very good, over by the lake not so good. I wrote my editor and I said, you will not assign this to anybody but me. I'm Paul Mejia. I'm a freelance arts and culture critic. I'm Kent Walgamot. I am the uh, music critic, rock critic at the Lincoln Journal Star in Lincoln, Nebraska. an innate human need to um, explicate our surroundings. Really engaging art from a thoughtful perspective is an art in itself. I always feel like I'm the filter between the fan and the artist. Any damn fool can create art. It's the critic who's really important because without stepping forward to say that this was good art or bad art. Uh... Rock magazines were born. Crawdaddy on the East Coast, Mojo Navigator on the West. I'd like to give credit to um, Greg Shaw and Paul Williams, who each uh, began to put out their own rock fanzines. Paul Williams and Crawdaddy kind of started it off. Science fiction and science fiction fandom was this wonderful breeding ground. You know, it was the free thinkers of the day. That's where fanzines came from, was the science fiction world. Okay, if you can do that with, with science fiction, you could also do that with rock and roll or with other things. There were people who had their own little magazines and would write about, you know, Isaac Asimov or something. Around 14, he started a um, science fiction fanzine called Within. A year or so later, he started Crawdaddy. And he'd had that experience of already knowing how to mimeograph. I, re I think it was probably the first the magazine I bought after, after we were looking at the monkeys and yardbirds in uh, 16 Magazine was, uh, was Crawdaddy, probably around 66 right then. This friend of mine introduced me to Paul Williams, and Paul Williams just hit on me mercilessly to write him articles. So Crawdaddy kind of started as a place where you could write about the stuff that you loved. I wrote an article called San Francisco Bay Rock for Crawdaddy, which is apparently the first national magazine article about the San Francisco scene. Uh, he was giving serious in-depth reviews to, you know, the Birds and the Buffalo Springfield, of course Dylan, Beatles and Stones. When I was a senior in high school, rock and roll had started talking to me in a big way. Then one day in late January 1966, I was in a drugstore off campus, looking at fan magazines aimed at teenage girls. I 